Okay, great. So uh, welcome to my studio. My friend Helen is really very kindly filming this so that I can get in there and show you some of the things that um, I want to talk about today. I wanted to start off just by saying that I'm coming from Kingston, Cataraqui. And this is actually the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. And, uh, and I really recognize that I'm here as an uninvited guest. As people who know my work, a lot of my work derives from a sense of place and a connection to the land. And I feel like part of the work that I'm trying to do is to better understand the uh, Indigenous history of this area. And uh, I'm happy to share with people some of the resources that I've been able to find about the local history so that we can all learn about this place. Um, I'm pretty interested in knowing where people are from. So if you are, would like to just in the chat say what part of the uh, world or country you're coming from, then that would, be, that would be great. And I'll look at that afterwards. Um, that's one of the great things about doing this in an online. There's lots of losses, but there's also the benefit is that we can connect with people from all over the place. So that's, um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Um, so today I'm going to be sharing my new studio with you. Uh, I set this, we renovated this garage in the uh, late fall last year, early winter. And so it was pretty good timing for COVID actually that this place, it was an old garage and quite dilapidated. And we just kind of fixed up the inside and it's a, uh, incredible to me to have access to this this space now. In my uh, promo for this, I was talking about working in a small space. And in fact, this area is of almost double what I have traditionally had up until this point. So this studio is, in my eyes, it's actually quite big, but some of the tricks and tips that I have for smaller spaces are, uh, are things that still are quite useful here. So I'm going to just get right into it and show you some of the things that I'm kind of geeking out about in terms of the space. So the first thing, and this I think is pretty easy to do in your own spaces if you're, uh, if this appeals to you. I work with slabs, and so Tom's just going to go around here. I work with slabs, and so often I roll out slabs on the slab roller and then prepare them by kind of uh, thinning them out a little bit, a bit and uh, cleaning them off and then I move them on to big uh, sheets of plastic and what I find is that having an extra workspace like this is uh, pretty incredible because then I can just lie them out on this and then it kind of tucks right into the, into the table and as you can see if Helen can get this on film it's a really easy setup like if you have a table and you can attach a wooden board to it and just cut a hole in it, there's no rollers or anything like that, but it works super well for basically having a doubling your workspace. So that has been um, really great. The other thing that was exciting to me in setting up this area was shelving. So it seems kind of funny to be so excited about shelving, but it's actually made a huge I practice. In my old studio, I had really big in hand and they were like about six feet high and the, the shells themselves were two feet deep and they were basically would hold those big plastic totes. And as you can see here, if you come over around here, I can show you the kind of work that I do. I make objects of different sizes. So sometimes I'll be on like a real run of making bowls of different sizes. And then I might switch things up a little bit and end up working on a whole bunch of plates. And so in my old studio, I was always like taking bricks and building up little shelves. And I spent a lot of time like moving things around. It was really quite inefficient. And so for this one, I decided that I wanted to have highly adjustable shelving. And so the, the systems are, they're not very expensive. They're very easy to install. And I got them from a place in Toronto that sells like commercial shelving units for stores. So if Helen, you want to come over here and I'll just do like the real demo of the shelves. 
So as you can see, like, so say I'm working on something that's uh, bigger than this. I'll take these two plates off that some kids made. You can just take them right out and then unhook them like that. And then all of a sudden you have a shelf area that's way bigger and you can fit, um, you know, say if I'm doing bowls, I can then go ahead and fit my bowls on there. So it seems kind of funny to get so excited about shelving, but it's, uh, it also, as you can see, like with the plates, it means that I've been able to dramatically increase my capacity for having storage. Um, and then I can also organize things in different uh, systems. So for example, all of the plates over here haven't been finished off. Um, they, they're just dry. And then when I finish them and do the edge and sort of take care of the bottom, then I'll move them over to this space and I'll do the two lines on the outside that I do on all of my plates. And then I know that they're ready to decorate. So that's, uh, that's my little shelving promo. And these boards I got just at, I think it was Rona, and they're MDF boards, and um, I had them cut them there because it was a lot easier than trying to cut them all. Or, oh no, actually we cut them ourselves, that's right. Um, and they had a section, and so what that means is the part that got cut off became also a little wear board, so I can work on these, and then I can, put them right onto my shelf and they match and they don't stick out and I'm not kind of bumping into them. So that was my little hack for the shelving. Um, the other thing I want to show you is that I've put everything that I can on wheels. And this is really, really helpful because it means that I can move my space. Like, you know, say I want to take advantage of a certain kind of light. So I move my restaurant mat. Then I can just move my table around like this and work facing the light in a certain way. Or what I've found super useful, oh geez, is um, this is a new addition. So obviously I have to get used to it. Um, is having a really small table that's on wheels and because this table is quite a bit smaller I can use it to expand the length of my slab roller or I can bring it over here and make my workspace. Um, often when I'm loading I move my it over here and then I can just be working like that and then use this as well as a space to load the kiln. So even if you can't put everything on wheels, having one little table on wheels, I have found to be really super um, useful. So the other thing that I wanted to show you is this new thing, which you could tell was new because I just bumped into it. Um, and this is a, a kind of a hack I've done using a selfie stick. And so, I find that like many of us in trying to um, put work onto Instagram and create some uh, social media contact, content, and I work all by myself in here. This is a very rare thing that I get a friend to come and help me, um, help me film. And so um, what I've done is I rigged up a selfie stick onto the beam in the ceiling. And so selfie sticks, again, like aren't very uh, expensive and then have a camera, a phone holder at the bottom. And then that way I can put my phone into this and film like a bird's eye view. And again, the, these rolling tables then come really into um, good use because I can situate the work right under the table. And then when I'm done with it, you know, I can just pop that up out of, out of the way. Um, and I have spent so much time mucking around trying to get good shots of me working and I'll like have buckets and be putting all of these things and trying to be balancing my phone and it ends up taking like so much time and really interrupting the flow of things. And, uh, 
and often the results aren't great. And so um, this is, I think, going to be a, a really handy um, feature to have in the studio. And having it on something rigid is key. Because at first I hooked up like a board on some chains. And then, of course, even just a little bit of a touch or some wind and the whole thing <laughs> swung back and forth. And so that obviously wasn't ideal. So the next thing that I want to show you that is, uh, I think, pretty great comes from my friend Katie, who's one of the owners of an amazing restaurant in Kingston called Northside. And they have to do lots of food and product shots. Um, for their social media and their business <laughs> and she gave me this great tip which was just to buy a chair this chair cost I think $40 uh, and I just didn't put the, um, the the legs on it obviously and then this becomes a really great thing to be able to take photos of the uh, pots on so I can just come around here and grab a pot um, so, of course, you have to pay attention to the light, but it's so light and versatile this, um, that I can move that around and you immediately don't have that backdrop and you can just like um, somebody looking at it would never know that this is actually on a chair. You've got that seamless, uh, you know, magical thing happening. So, so that's the other great hack that I have. I'm just going to look at my paper to see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, and the only other thing is that trying to, oh yeah, the walls. So when we did this studio, we were trying to sort of reduce costs as much as possible. And so all of the electrical is outside. And that is really useful because it can be moved around uh, if necessary. Um, and also you know where it is. And then it turned out that OSB was going to be a lot less expensive than drywall. And OSB turns out is, has been totally fantastic because I, with drywall there's often a kind of preciousness around it and you don't want to make a hole and then you have to find a stud and all of those kinds of things. Whereas I find that I'm using my wall space, you can see here, uh, way more in this studio and it's and it doesn't feel like if I put a hole in the OSB with a thumbtack it doesn't feel like it matters very much um, and then if you want to come around here Helen I've rigged up an area here where I am putting up all of my um, kiln furniture and again it just means like I could put those absolutely anywhere and and not have to worry about either hitting any wires or um, ending up with drywall, like having to look for studs and dealing with drywall plugs and things like that. So the OSB has been, has been really great as well. So I don't know if I want to, just before I go on and talk a little bit about some of the work that I'm doing now, uh, does, if anybody has any questions about the studio space, Okay. There aren't any questions in the chat yet, Marnie, but one question that I would have for you is about water. I'm in a basement studio as well without water. Oh, I notice yeah. you don't have a sink there. Can you talk about how you do clean up and that kind of stuff in your space? Oh, it's pretty friend. complicated, sadistic water system. So you're going to need to take notes, okay? It involves getting an old jug and being in the house and filling it up repeatedly. <laughs> and then my clay water, I just actually go and tip it outside in the garden. So I just go and do that. Um, for reclaim, I have a reclaim system. Um, and so what I do, I add that chair out. Um, I have this bucket. But as I'm working, I put clay into uh, the bag, and then I just kind of step on it, like to get it mushy and going. And when I have a bunch in the bucket, 
Then I have, I don't have room for a wedging table. And so I do have these two uh, bins with um, plaster in them. And so I just take out one of these bins. You can see that there's some clay in there right now. And I lay the clay out on the plaster and then I wedge it in the bin. And then I use that as a reclaim. I, I find that with my work, I can't use a lot of reclaim making actual pieces, but I use it to make molds and things like that. Um, and that also reminds me, I wanted to show you, this is a tip that I just learned from a workshop with Katie Miller, and it's an airtight um, plastic bin that I got from Staples. And I just put a board and some craft foam on the bottom, and this makes a really, really great damp box. And the good thing about this too is that because it's so portable and lightweight, I can move it around. And so if I wasn't maybe keeping my studio nice and tidy and clean for a studio tour online, I could have like a whole bunch of these like stacked up on the floor or on top of the kiln or whatever, and it's pretty easy to move them. So that makes a whole bunch of new, like different kinds of storage space for work that you're trying to keep wet um, or more moist for longer than on the shelves. So that's a, another hack that's pretty good to share and I was glad to learn that from her. Okay, so is that, if there's nothing else, any other questions people have, then I can just talk a little bit about some of the work I'm doing. Um, so, what I'm working on right now is a series of, um, so I, well, I'll back up a little bit. I got a grant to go to Hawaii to look at uh, endemic uh, plants in Hawaii and study them and sort of learn about more the cultural relationship that people have to these plants and to the natural environment there. And that trip took place right at the beginning of COVID, so I was able to fit in about um, two thirds of it before we kind of had to come back uh, uh, rather quickly. Um, and so the work that I'm doing now is figuring out how to take what I learned there and saw there and use that as a source of inspiration in my work and communicate that through the work that, that I make now. And so I'm doing that in two different ways. The an original idea was to make just a whole set of tableware and have um, an exhibit of the tableware and the photographs and some drawings. I did a lot of field drawings while I was there. And so I'm still working on that. I don't really know because of COVID how it's gonna be shown yet, but I'm working on a series of, of uh, dishes that are all about um, canoe plants. So if Helen, if you wanna come over here. So this, this plate here, is a um, in process You're freezing up for a second there, Marnie. Could you sorry, could you just repeat what you sorry. just said? Yeah. We lost you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, so I can Maybe we'll come back here and face your better. So the, when the Polynesians came over to Hawaii, they brought about 26 different plants. And the fascinating thing about this is it was like, can you imagine yourself packing for a trip? Like when I pack for a trip or when I used to pack for a trip, I would have like certain clothes and maybe a snack and different things that I needed. But the Polynesians, they packed their suitcase basically with plants. And so with these 26 plants, they pro provided everything that they needed. Food, shelter, um, plants that could be made into cloth, things for uh, medicines, basically everything that they needed to sustain their community was found in these plants. And uh, that's just a fascinating concept to me. And I think it also reveals the depth of knowledge and understanding about um, 
plants that often a lot of us kind of take for granted and don't really know, all, that don't have all of that knowledge. And so what I'm doing is a set of tableware that is uh, based on these plants, uh, these canoe plants. Because over and over and over again, I was, that's what people were talking a lot about when I was in Hawaii, was the, the how essential these plants are for people. So this is a plate that's in process, that's uh, the banana plant. And I'll just go and get the cup that I made. And this is an example of a finished piece that's uh, again using the same banana plant. So I'll do a series of 26 plates that have these plants on them. And then some of the other uh, things that I was looking at were these, um, the way that plants, like a lot of trees would have these plants that kind of clustered all around the base. So some of the work that I'm going to make is more like the canoe plant series where it's really talking a lot about um, the meaning of the plants and some of what I saw there just has provided me with a lot of um, visual language for um, a kind of a whimsical interpretation of plants that you find in my work. Uh, so I'm doing some plant, some pots that are about that as well. Uh, and then the other thing that I've ended up doing is actually drawing on windows. So during the early parts of COVID with the lockdown, my son was at home and I wasn't feeling actually particularly creative. The studio here wasn't fully set up. And I would go around and see all of these drawings on windows and I thought, well, that's something that I could actually do. And he could scooter back and forth. So I started to do chalk drawings. So I took the drawings that I had done and then blew them up much bigger and drew on the outside of people's houses. And some of those were plants found in our kind of local environment. And some of them were sort of more fantastical, inspired by Hawaii. And then right now, this fall, I just started doing Hawaii-based drawings on the outside of long-term care homes. So um, I went to Rito Crest, which is a, a home near here, near where I live, and drew on the outside of the Alzheimer's ward and drew different um, endemic Hawaiian plants uh, with, um, yeah, to try to add some kind of vibrancy and beauty to the environment that the residents are in and also the people who are outside visiting them. Um, and also just to uh, make the parallel between, um, I don't know, just think about the, the beauty that we still need, especially in kind of harsher times. And those drawings will be accompanied by a write-up that I'm gonna put outside that talks about but the plant, some of the plants and why I chose them. And this directly comes from experiences that I had in my trip. So, so those are like the, the window drawings, the tableware, there's a, sort of the two main projects that I'm doing. And then the third one that's in process is I'm trying to figure out a way of making large scale wall decals that I would like to have put in institutional spaces so that, for example, you'd be in a hospital and you'd actually come into a waiting room and there would be all of these very large flowers that are on the walls. So I've been doing some of those drawings and I often have my drawings like in the studio. So, um, so I've been doing drawings like these some that are Hawaii inspired and some that aren't. Whoops. There we go. That's a magnolia from in Kingston. This is a Hawaiian plant. Just playing with different colors. Anyway, just experimenting with these drawings with the hope to figure out how to make them quite big and print it as wall decals. And then what I've done is started to also translate those onto pots as well. So uh, I'll just grab a here. In Hawaii, I stayed with a woman whose son owned a protea farm. 
And so uh, she had lots and lots of proteas around. And so um, this is canister or a utensil holder is based on that. And then these are, um, this is a magnolia, which kind of references like, uh, as we were, you know, so bound to this place, I found myself looking at the plants locally with new eyes as well. And so um, this is a piece that has to do with the magnolias. And then this is just a kind of fantastical one. And this is inspired by some of the ways that I saw these like kind of clusters of, of plant life uh, growing in unusual places like off of trees. And hopefully at some point down the road, I'll end up doing some sculptural work. So I've started a little bit of a foray into that, like looking at trying to take my drawings and turn them into um, sculptural pieces. And so, Eventually, I would like to also make some sculptures, but we'll see if that happens. That would be down the road. So yeah, so that's like an overview of some of the things that I'm working on. And I hope that people have had yet some ideas for their own studio practice of little tricks that they can use either for photography or for just uh, making their space a bit more um, suited to their particular ways of making. So. That's it for me, and if, unless somebody has more questions or something that they want to say. This has been fabulous, Marnie. I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, if anybody wanted to even unmute themselves to ask Marnie a question, you can feel free to do that. Um, but for me, I know this was super enlightening in terms of I rethinking my entire studio space in my own home. And I thank you so much for the generosity of not just sharing all those sorts of tips and stuff, but also um, sharing your work so generously with us. It's You've really been somebody that's been very inspiring during COVID in how you've just sort of taken your practice out into the world and you know your drawings and stuff and doing all of those window projects and stuff is really inspiring and really beautiful. So thanks for sharing sharing that with us, Marnie. Great, well, thank, thanks a lot for to Carol. Carol's been doing a phenomenal amount to get Canadian clay artists on the table for Clay Week. And so I think we all owe her a big thanks uh, for that. And uh, it's Make and Do, which is a national ceramics group that's hosting this event. And for any practicing clay artists who are out there, Make and Do, we have a directory that we're trying to get all of the people who make pots on this directory so that you could look at any part of Canada and be able to see who's involved with clay in that area. And you don't have to have like a high level of expertise or incredible photos of your work. It's, uh, it's you know, a lot of the times people ask like, am I good enough to be on the directory? And the answer is yes, and it's totally free. So I also really encourage people to put themselves on the map, so to speak. It's a literal map and put yourselves on the map so that when, uh, when people are looking either virtually or in person across the country, they'll be able to see really the rich community of clay makers that uh, exist in the country. So that's over at makeanddo.ca. And uh, it's also a great website to find out more about ceramics in Canada. So that's my little promo for Make and Do. I'm gonna close it here just to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come and spend it with me. And uh, I really owe Helen uh, a lot for doing the filming because it made it so much easier. So thanks, Helen. Welcome. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks for Thank you, Marnie, and thank you, everybody, for joining Bye. us today. Bye. Okay, that was very good. I love those bars. Right.